the third February 1998, the second disaster of service. This massacre occurred when an American prowler flew under the cables of the service cable car, hitting and severing all the cables and hence sending a fully loaded cabin with 20 people on board to the ground. All the 20 people were dead. Most people know about this tragic incident. However, they don't know that on this same cable car, even more tragic incident occurred 22 years earlier, on 9th of March 1976. There are several interesting facts connecting these two disasters. Not only the facts that during both disasters the carrier cable was fully snapped. In nearly all other disasters the carrier cable was intact. There can be many reasons that can lead to a cable car disaster. However, the snapping of a carrier cable is very rare. Carrier cables are very strong and even an impact of a small plane should not break them. However, on this one cable car, a carrier cable snapped on both occasions. On the first occasion, it was sheared by the traction cable which crossed over it. On the second occasion, it was cut by the wings of the American power jet. What's more interesting is a coincidental similarity in the surnames of the people who were blamed responsible for the disaster. The operator in charge in the disaster of 1976 was called Carlo Schweitzer, the navigator of the plane which cut the cables of the same cable car in 1998 was called Joseph Schweitzer. The only difference in their surnames is an extra T in the name of Joseph Schweitzer. On both occasions it was late afternoon and the fully loaded cabin of skiers returning from their day on the slopes was heading back to Cavalese. Both cabins hit the ground approximately 200 meters from each other. These are the locations of the two Cernus cable car disasters. What's also interesting is that the cabin operator Marcello Banzo, who died on the 3rd of February 1998 in the second Cernus disaster, lived in this farmhouse. In his backyard, the first service disaster occurred on 9th of March 1976. After witnessing the cable car disaster of 1976 in his backyard, little did he know that he would be a victim of another cable car disaster. After swapping his shift with a friend on the 3rd of February 1998, as an operator in the cabin. After the 1998 incident, his body was lying outside of the cabin with the other 19 people inside. Everyone was dead. Let's begin with a bit of history. In the 1960s, Cavalese was a town which was booming after the Second World War, like many other places and new skin areas were built. This photo from the 60s shows the plan of where the future cable car would be built, with two sections, first from Cavalese to Dos de Laras station, the second from Dos de Laras to the top of service. The company who was to build the cable car was called Holzer. The section of the cable car where the accident occurred was built in 1964. Its length being 2,590 meters and going from a sea height of approximately 1,000 meters in Cavalese to Dos de Laresse station which was 280 meters higher. 
The cable car to be built was designed to consist of two cabins going up and down in alternate directions. Each cabin was made for 40 people and one cabin operator. Maximum speed of the cabins was allowed to be 10 meters per second with the capacity to transport approximately 420 people per hour. The section of the cable car was divided by two pylons. The pylons were made of concrete like the one in this picture when the cable car was built. You can see the pylons in this black and white image. The cable car was designed to be operating for approximately 30 years. However, the incident occurred only 12 years after the cable car was built. It was the mid-70s. This was the era of a ski boom when tens of thousands of skiers went to the Alps to go skiing. Cavalese was one of the biggest ski areas in North Italy. Cavalese was visited by thousands. Because of this large influx of skiers, there were always long queues both in the morning at the bottom station in Cavalese and then in the late afternoon at the top station at Los de Larese when skiers went back home. The cable car ride took approximately six and a half minutes from either Cavalese to Dos de Larese or back down from Dos de Larese to Cavalese. Because of these long queues of skiers and to increase profits, management was trying to find out ways which would reduce the traveling time between Cavalese and Dos de Larese. When a cabin passes a pylon, it needs to slow down for safety reasons. The slowing down can be done either by a manual operation by an operator at the middle station in those days, or there is an automatic programmer which was installed at this particular cable car and which either slows down the cabin next to the pylon or which stops it if the operator tries to go too fast over the pylon. In order to reduce the traveling time from six and a half minutes to approximately five and a half minutes, which is one minute difference, the management together with the employers of the cable car decided to alter the programmer so that the cabins don't slow down at all or only slow down a little when passing over the pylons. It was believed that this would not create any danger because the cable car was believed to be very sturdy and uh, it was only thought it may create a little discomfort to the passengers because the cabins would shake a little when passing the pylons. It's March 1976. Between the 8th of March and the 12th of March, many schools in Italy are closed for the spring holidays. Therefore, many tourists go to ski and the alpine ski areas are fully packed with skiers. 9th of March, 1976, Tuesday. Many people are on the slopes, skiing, enjoying their holiday. Nobody knows what is about to happen. It's a nice sunny day, which many people have enjoyed. Some people decide to watch the sunset and stay. Others decide to go back to Cavalese. The people who decided to watch the sunset didn't know that this choice might have saved their life. Approximately 5 o'clock p.m. The people who decide to go to Cavalese begin to form a long queue of skiers waiting for their cable car ride down, which was at the time the only transport option from the ski resort back to Cavalese. Therefore, it was quite natural that long queues, especially during school holidays, formed. The cabin operators wanted 
to mitigate these cues, therefore they employed the system when cabins did not slow down at the pylons. Tuesday, 9th of March, 1976, approximately 5.15 p.m. The operator of the lower stretch of the service cable car, Carlo Schweitzer, is responsible for the stretch of the cable car. He does not have a license to operate such cable car. The reason? It is cheaper to employ employers who do not have a license. Carlo Schweitzer was a post office worker from the town of Bozano and he was hired only for one week of the school holidays so that more staff can work and cope with the increased number of skiers. Carlo Schweitzer was not the only person without a license. In these times, many cable car companies employed drivers who had no license to operate a cable car. These drivers were given simple instructions to operate a cable car. Operating a cable car is not very difficult. It only speeds up, slows down, you need to close the doors, make sure they are locked, and that's it. Unless an exceptional situation happens. The majority of what is learned to become a cable car operator or driver comprises of being ready for unexpected situations. Such situations can become very dangerous. One such situation is just about to occur. The post office worker Carlo Schweitzer, who reported sick to be absent from his post office job and work as the cable car during the school holidays to earn more money, is just about to load a cabin full of people. Many of the occupants of the cabin are children, 15 exactly. There is a tension to get the skiers down as fast as possible. This is because the shift is about to end, but the queue is still very long and skiers are nervous because they need to wait half an hour or more just to get on the lift. Because there are mostly children in this cabin, the operator decides to load 42 people. This is justified because they are children. Totally, the cabin has 42 occupants and one cabin operator. Totally 43 people. The fully loaded cabin at the middle station of Dos de Larese is beginning to go down to the valley. This type of cable car has two cables. This photo is from a different cable car. One cable is the supporting cable. It is much stronger, thicker and uh, basically holds the whole weight of the cabin. The second cable is called a traction cable. This traction cable pulls the cabin along the support cable. As the cabin travels, oscillations along the tractor cable are a frequent occurrence. These oscillations occur for various reasons. Under normal conditions, these oscillations do not pose any danger. The magnitude of the oscillations depends on several factors, such as the weight of the cabin, the distance between the cabin and the pylon, and the speed of the cabin. These oscillations are a normal occurrence on every type of cable car with two cables. During the constructions of every cable car, these oscillations are calculated and based on that, the distance between pylons and the recommendation of the maximum weight that can be applied to every cabin, certain instructions are given. These instructions mainly give limitations to the maximum speed of the cabin that is allowed and the need to slow down when passing a pylon and the speed at which a pylon can be crossed. These instructions must always be followed when there are people in 
in the cabin. On this occasion in Kavaise, these instructions were not followed. Cabins were operated at a faster speed than allowed and, based on the reports of several people, they did not slow down at all near the middle pylon. This is the second pylon or the lower pylon in this picture. In general, the faster the speed of the cabin, the greater the oscillations. Also, the greater the distance between the pylon and the cabin, the bigger the oscillations. And finally, the heavier the load in the cabin, the bigger the oscillations. On this occasion, 43 people were inside the cabin. On this occasion, it is believed that the weight of all the people inside the cabin was not higher than the maximum allowed weight that could be loaded. This was because most of the occupants were children. Anyway, the cabin was fully cramped. Among the children who boarded the cabin are three friends. Alexandra, Giovanni and Francesca. These three friends were separated from the rest of the group who was there on a school trip during their school holidays. Out of all the people inside the cabin, only Alexandra will survive this tragic incident. Her full name is Alexandra Piovesana. Later on, she would provide valuable information for the trials and for the reconstruction of this tragic incident. Alessandra and her friends decided to stand on the front side of the cabin. This is facing down towards Cavalese. This proved to be crucial in saving her life. As this tragic, fully packed cabin starts to descend, it passes the top pylon in this image. On the whole stretch of this cable car, there were just two pylons. This pylon was only approximately 30 meters from top station. After the cabin passed this pylon, it speeded up. The operator operated the cabin at full speed of more than 10 meters per second, more than allowed, and didn't slow down near the lower pylon. As the fully loaded cabin approaches the middle pylon at full speed without slowing down, the oscillations on the tractor cable are very large. As soon as the cabin crosses the middle pylon, the traction cable swings over the support cable and an overlap of cables occurs. This is an animation which shows how the overlap occurred. The cabin, which was on the right hand side of the cable car when looking down on the right side, just passed this middle pylon. The cabin is somewhere in this area. Because of the large speed of the cabin, its load and the distance between the middle pylon and the top pylon, there was a very large oscillation in the traction cable. As soon as the cabin crossed the pylon, the oscillation was emphasized. This caused an overlap as shown in this animation. This is just an animation and not in reality. The overlap at the bottom pylon was approximately 1 meter from the pylon. I will show it again. The cable swings over and because of the oscillation it goes higher than the traction cable, goes over it and goes back down. This causes a situation where there is the cabin, here the cable goes 
on the pylon, then crosses the traction cable, goes down, then there must have been another region where cables overlapped, and then it goes back to the pylon. There is a safety system in place which is designed to stop the cabins immediately when an overlap occurs. An overlap is not a rare phenomenon or situation. Overlaps often occur on these types of cable car which can be due to various reasons such as high wind or the oscillations. An overlap is a dangerous situation. If this situation occurs, the cabin and the cable must be stopped immediately. The safety circuit system is designed so that when a short circuit occurs, it senses the cables touched each other and immediately stops cabins. This is what happened on this occasion. As the cabin passed this pylon, the system was engaged and the cabin halted abruptly and started swinging. After this, the cabin remained stationary for several minutes. What happened during those several minutes? A telephone call between Carlo Schweitzer and his colleague Aldo Gian Moena. Because Carlo Schweitzer had no training, he did not know what happened and what he needs to do. So he called his colleague who was at the top station of the cable car at Mount Service. It must be noted that this phone call was not recorded and what is known is based on reports. However, the telephone call may have looked something like this. Hi Aldo, this is Carlo. I have a little problem. The cabin stopped and there are several lights which should not be on. I don't know what to do. What shall I do? Oh Carlo, based on your description, it looks like the safety system which starts when the cables touch each other engaged. This can happen quite often. For example, if a gust of wind makes the cables touch each other, the system stops the cabins. What you need to do is disengage the system and restart the cabin. You need to press these buttons to do it. Oh, thank you, Aldo. You saved me. So, I will follow your instructions, disengage the safety system, and we'll restart the cabin going down. Thank you for your advice. Goodbye. Bye, Carlo. Based on the advice of Aldo Gianmoena, Carlo Schweitzer disengaged the safety system and restarted the cabins. This was a crucial mistake. The safety system engaged because an emergency state had occurred. Carlo Schweitzer didn't know it. However, as well as post office worker, he was an electrician. Also, he knew that a safety system engaged and that he was disengaging it and restarting the cabin. Even that he was given the advice by an experienced colleague, he should have known that disengaging a safety system should not be done. Purely believing that a gust of wind made the cables touch each other was not a sufficient excuse to disengage it. A visual inspection of the cables should have been done as a minimum. The cables overlapped very close to the view of Carlo Schweitzer. It was just after the pylon in this image. It was less than 40 meters from his view. It is difficult to say who is at blame more. Aldo Gianmoena 
certainly should have come down and checked what happened, giving purely an advice to disengage the system without inspecting anything was a crucial mistake. With long queues, end of the shift and end of the day, nearing at this late hour, it would have been a great inconvenience to stop the cabins and inspect them. This would take a minimum of one hour of time, which would be a large inconvenience to both the skiers who are queuing as well as to the employees who were nearly going home. So a decision was made to disengage the safety system and restart the cabins. This mistake led to the worst ever cable car disaster where 42 people lost their lives. So after this crucial mistake of restarting the cabin, this is what happened. This is approximately the view from the cabin looking down towards Kamalaise as it stopped at the pylon. Alexandra Piovesana, the only survivor, was at the front of the cabin looking down towards Kamalaise. This would have been her view from the cabin. As the cabin stopped just after passing the pylon, it swung for a while. Then it stopped swinging and was stationary for several minutes. This was during the phone call between Carlo Schweitzer and Aldo Gianmoena. When Carlo Schweitzer restarted the cabins, the engine was started and the traction cable started pulling again. Because of the overlap above the pylon, the traction cable had extra tension in it. This was preventing the cabin going down from moving. As soon as the engine was restarted, the cabin in this image, the other one which was going up, started to move immediately. There was only one person, the cabin operator, in that cabin. However, the fully loaded cabin going downwards did not start moving straight away. There was a delay before it began moving. This was the first sign that something was wrong. In the full cabin, there was a cabin operator who was 18 years old. He did not survive. However, if he noticed this anomaly, he could have telephoned Carlo Schweitzer that something is not right, and Carlo Schweitzer could have stopped the cabin, preventing the disaster. This is a very simple animation made from automated images. These are all made from one image and show what it looked like from Alexandra Piovesana's view. Please note how the cabin going up starts moving straight away. The cabin going down is stationary while the traction cable moves closer to the support cable. This is because of the overlap blocking the cabin and the traction cable becoming tense. This is what was first seen by the people looking down. When the traction cable became fully tense, the power of the engine started to pull the cabin downwards even that there was an overlap upstream of the cabin. When the cabin started to move, it started so with a jerk because the fully tense cable suddenly pulled it at full speed while the overlap above was creating tension. Therefore, the cabin started to swing. From the moment the cabin was restarted, there was approximately 90 seconds before the supporting cable snapped. This was plenty of time to notice that something was wrong and stop the engine pulling the cabins. 
There were many signs showing that something was clearly wrong. The operator in the cabin going down should have noticed something is wrong and should have called Carlo Schweitzer. This must have been obvious because the ride down was not smooth as usual. Because of the overlap upstream, the ride was jerky. The cabin was not moving down smooth, but it was moving in jerks, swinging along the way. The view of the passengers would have looked something like this. The cable was jerking. This was not the usual oscillation seen in the cable, because the cabin was pulled, then it stopped, then the cable became tense again, the cabin was pulled again, then it stopped, the cable became loose, then it became tense again, and then it pulled the cabin again. This was very abnormal. Several eyewitnesses who saw the cabin fall from Cavalese saw it swinging. This was the reason that it was swinging. Alexandra Piovesana, the survivor, remembered all the details what happened before the accident. People inside the cabin, who were largely children, did not seem to be nervous. There was a group of German boys making jokes, laughing, just going about their day, not knowing what will happen in the next 90 seconds. When the cabin was moving down in jerks and swinging, the children and people generally just laughed about it. They did not think about it as an imminent danger. The children thought it was some kind of a game. This is what it likely sounded like in the cabin as it was swinging. <laughs> Oh, this is worse than the other one. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the bottom station, the person who loads people on and off the cabins and closes the doors behind them was chatting to his friend. When they were chatting, the cable car stopped. The friend of the dispatcher noticed that the cabins stopped. He noticed that the noise of the engine was not heard. Therefore, he asked, Is there a power outage or something? Why did the cabins suddenly stop? The operator replied, Oh, don't worry. This stop sometimes is not power outage. In the meantime, Giorgio De Matteo, the cabin operator traveling in the opposite direction alone in the cabin upwards, notices the overlap. He picks up the phone in the cabin and tries to alert Carlos Schweitzer at the middle stations. Unfortunately, it is too late. Just before the support cable on the right hand side when looking down gave way to the shear produced by the traction cable overlap across it, sparks were visible near the support pylon where the cables overlapped. Meanwhile, at the bottom station, the operator keeps chatting to his friend, not even noticing that the cars were restarted and the engine is pulling again. Suddenly, telephone rings. The cabin dispatcher at the bottom station excuses himself to his friend and goes to pick up the phone. The phone is coming from the cabin attendant who just noticed the overlap. Before the cabin dispatcher manages to pick up the phone 
an extremely loud boom occurs. The support cable snaps and the counterweights that keep it stretched under tension fall to the ground. Because they are heavy, the sound when they hit the ground is like a loud explosion. Just seconds before the fall, the cabin fully loaded with 43 people on board is very high, approximately 70 meters above ground. This is approximately the view that the passengers in the cabin would have seen just before the fall. Alessandra Piovesana was looking at Cavalese. Just before the cable snapped, the ride became smooth again. Traction cable cut inside the carrying cable. The jerks were less frequent, the ride was smoother, but vibrations were spreading throughout the traction cable. These vibrations were heard inside the cabin as a noise, which must have sounded something like this. At this point, passengers started to feel that something is wrong. They started to be afraid. Alessandra Piovesana held onto her friend Francesca because they started to be afraid about what is happening. Suddenly, the cabin jerked backwards and fell. This view was taken much later after the fall, approximately 40 years later. Therefore, the scenery is very different. There are more trees and you can see the new cable car. However, as a simulation, it shows what the people saw just before they fell, and it will show how the fall must have looked like. These were the last seconds of the cable car, and unfortunately, 42 people on board. a view of the field where the cabin fell. The view is from a height of 70 meters, approximately the same height from which the cabin fell. The fall lasted only three seconds. This is an animation of what the fall looked like from the bottom station. People who saw the cabin fall described it as swinging. Then the cabin apparently fell like a kite. I can imagine it looks like a kite. The cable goes to the cabin and the cabin which was red must have looked like a kite. Unfortunately, it was falling. The cabin fell from a height of 70 meters. The three-ton overhead carriage crushed the cabin. Because the safety system was disengaged, when the carrier cable snapped, the engine was not stopped and kept pulling the cabin. This resulted in the fact that when the cabin hit the ground, it was further pulled down by the engine. The tractor cable or pulling cable did not snap, and when the cabin hit the ground, it still connected the cabin to the engine at the bottom station which kept pulling. The result was the cabin slid down for a further 
100 meters. Looking from the top station, when the cable snapped, the tension caused the top part of the carrier cable, which is the cable on the right hand side, to spring backwards and this heavy cable hit the windows of this top station. Carlo Schweitzer sitting on the chair in the picture was surprised by the fall of the cable car and he had to crouch down under the driving board to hide from the impact of the cable. Before he realized what happened and stopped the engine and the cabin, the traction cable pulled the cabin the distance of approximately 100, possibly 150 meters along the ground. The cabin was heavily damaged. It was basically a pile of rubber. It is no surprise that there was only one survivor and 42 people dead. Even the fact that one people survived seems like a mystery. There are several facts which contributed to the surviving of Alessandra Piovesana who was standing at the front of the cabin. Because the cabin hit a slope, its rear side hit the ground first. This is the view of the rear side of the cabin. It is completely crushed and all the people on the rear side were likely instantly killed as a result of the impact with the ground. Although the whole cabin does not look very nice, you can see it is slightly less damaged on the left side which is the front side of the cabin. This view is from the other side. Right part is towards Kavaleza, left part is towards top of the mountain. Although fully smashed, the right part or the front part is less damaged and there is more scope or higher chance to survive. Since the cabin hit the ground, with the rear side first, the passengers standing at the front of the cabin may have been protected by the people or bodies behind them from the impact. In addition, the three-ton overhead carriage, which was located above the rear part of the cabin, smashed the rear part. The front part is less impacted. This video shows the scene of the incident the next morning. People stand around the fallen cables in the area where the cabin was dragged along the ground. This is view of the damaged cabin. It can be seen that the cabin is squashed backwards. After the cabin fell, the first people to arrive at the scene could still hear people inside. Many people survived the impact but died shortly after due to suffocation. It is interesting that people died due to suffocation rather than injuries caused by the impact. The cabin crammed full of people and being squashed likely led to the fact that people simply could not breathe. Help arrived shortly after with firefighters and ambulances on the scene. Several people survived the incident and were taken out of the cabin alive. This included the only survivor Alessandra Piovesana as well as her friend Francesca. Unfortunately, Francesca died at the hospital. 
the scene immediately after the incident was not nice. There were screams of children calling mom, one man was calling I will be back in Milan shortly, and even Alexandra remembers the moments shortly after the fall. She briefly passed out, but then awakened before her arrived and tried to get out of the cabin. It is possible that the drag of the cabin along the ground may have significantly exacerbated the damage and maybe even the number of fatalities. If the engine was stopped immediately after the cabin fell, the cabin would not have been driven for more than 100 meters along the ground at a speed of 10 meters per second. see the traction cable still being tense while the thicker support cable is lying on the ground. The traction cable 